Um, I'm going to start by introducing just what my lab does, which is working primarily on genetically engineered macrophages, um, both as a tool to understand the underlying biology as well as, um, as a potential therapeutic platform. So we're doing this in partnership with Blue Rock Therapeutics, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Bayer. Um, they've been wonderful partners for us in advancing this and answering some of the questions that I don't necessarily know about advancing cells to clinic. So in our lab, uh, we usually start with patient samples. So we're sort of doing this a little bit backwards from the way that many immunologists approach a problem, which is to start with mouse studies and um, try to translate them to humans. We actually have with um, a lot of collaboration and coordination within our department, um, been working with a number of the surgeons, neuro-oncologists, nurses, um, radiologists to get samples directly from patients as they undergo surgical resection at the university. And from those patients, we collect blood serum and tumor tissue, which we then use for ex vivo discovery to identify novel biomarkers, determine key factors in the microenvironment, um, and also to define novel cell subsets that may be present in the tumor. As I mentioned, we're then taking this into engineered macrophages, which we're using in two ways, both as a cell therapy platform and as tools to understand ma macrophage biology, things from um, trafficking to engraftment to survival. And then through a variety of collaborations, again, some within our own department, we've been validating these approaches um, by evaluating tumor burden and survival and animal models, um, gene expression in those um, cells that we generate, as well as their functions, and then taking them back to patient samples through a variety of tissue microarrays um, for a next iterative cycle to evaluate what's going on in the patients. So for those of you who aren't very familiar with macrophages and um, why we care about them so much, um, I view them really in an extremely biased fashion as a keystone for regulating the type, magnitude, and duration of immune responses. They really are the gatekeepers to the rest of the immune response, and that's inclusive of all kinds of lymphocytes like T cells, NK cells, and B cells. Signals coming from macrophages can actually induce uh, cytokines and chemokines and cytotoxicity, all of the things that we view as really beneficial to anti-tumor responses in T cells, as well as the same in NK cells. And so we view this as a potential to induce a pleiotropic um, immune response that's made up of a variety of different cell types. And to some degree, they can actually induce class switching in B cells as well and generate antibody responses. So if we could figure out how to fine tune the way that macrophages interacted with other types of lymphocytes, we might be able to engage in whole system immune response to tumors. And immunotherapies are one way to do this. So immunotherapies are really at the forefront of how we're looking to treat solid tumors, and in particular with the successes that we've seen in hematologic malignancies through the CAR T cell um, wave of success we're really noticing that the immune system is sufficient to eliminate cancer. And immunotherapies as a result are changing the way that cancer treat patients are treated, but they don't really work very well in solid tumors. Um, there are rare exceptions to this. Some cases of melanoma and non-small cell lung respond very well. We still aren't clear on why that is. But there are a number of challenges that come with this. Um, the first is the potential for incomplete responses. So in a solid tumor in particular, and glioblastoma is no exception, there's the potential for tumor heterogeneity. And so we know that not every single cell expresses the same antigens all the time. And there's the potential for neoepitope loss, which just means that the target that they may be expressing um, has the tendency to get lost. And if you have even one cell that can figure out how to grow and divide in the absence of expressing that antigen, you've essentially rendered your CAR T cell therapy ineffective. There's also the need for things like antibody um, treatments that um, have the need for frequent intervention, and that's because they have poor um, persistence in the body. So patients are coming in three or four times a week to get antibodies delivered. And what we've noticed is that there's also poor tissue penetrance, and in particular in the central nervous system, that's additionally um, challenging because um, we have to cross the blood-brain barrier, and many antibodies we know don't do that. So getting your therapy to the target is extremely important. Uh, the um, undesired off-target effects that can come with things that are delivered intravenously um, that may or may not actually impact the tumor at all, but also impact every other tissue in the body. 
And finally, the biology that we tend to tackle in my own lab is the complex tumor microenvironment, which is comprised of a variety of soluble surface and cellular mechanisms that are kind of inherently designed to suppress the immune system. So what you end up with is this um, very challenging multiplexed hurdle that you have to get over. Uh, one of the areas that we've been focusing on is the role of macrophages in that immunosuppression, um, those pro-tumor macrophages that populate the tumor, and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, are very effective at suppressing T cell, NK cell, and B cell activation. And kind of the common um, immunotherapies that I alluded to in the prior slide include things like CAR T cells and small molecules designed to activate T cells. Um, CAR NK cells, as well as the cytokines that they respond to, and checkpoint blockade and antibody drug conjugates um, that might do the work of B cells to um, influence that immune response. Uh, this is a tissue microarray that, that was made in collaboration um, with um, our neuropathologist internally. Um, we did um, CD163 staining, which is a marker of macrophages, and selected um, two cores from each tissue one for intratumorally and one peritumorally. And this is just an example of representative staining of that that was done by Rob Pierce's group at the Fred Hutch um, showing the macrophage infiltration. So what you can see is that giant circle in the middle is a blood vessel. And you can see that there are T cells and B cells that are in the blood vessel, but they're largely perivascular. We don't know if they're trying to get in, um, but for whatever reason, they're not infiltrating that tumor tissue effectively. In contrast, shown in um, the magenta color, there is macrophages that effectively infiltrate tumor tissue. And it's not unique to um, glioblastoma, though it's something that has been noted repeatedly, not just by us, but by many groups. Um, it's also present in a number of other types of solid tumors of various tissues all over the body. Um, so we know that macrophages have the information and the capacity to infiltrate solid tumors even if we aren't aware of what those secrets are, um, we were wondering whether or not we could use this to our advantage as a me method to um, uh, allow targeted delivery of therapeutic proteins delivered by macrophages. And so the um, process that we typically use is to take blood from currently healthy donors, um, where we select the CD14 positive monocytes from their peripheral blood. We differentiate those cells for six days in the presence of a colony stimulating factor called GMCSF, and then we transduce with um, a macrophage optimized platform of lentivirus that's different from the CAR T, and I'll show you what that data looks like in a moment, um, something that's specific for macrophages. And what the hope is here is that these macrophages could then encode um, expression, constitutive expression of a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Uh, whether that's uh, something secreted. We've also done a number of surface markers, um, and I'll show you the classes of proteins that we've been examining um, in the engineering of these cells. But the hope is that we would then be able to inspire the activation of T cells and K cells and B cells in an antigen unrestricted fashion so that we could get good responses to um, solid tumors, even if we have yet to define the antigens. So I mentioned that the, the current T cell protocol doesn't work very well. Um, you can see those data on the left when we use the lentivirus that um, Mike Jensen's lab, for example, uses to modify CAR T cells to get CAR expression. Um, we used a, a lentivirus here just encoding the green fluorescent protein and then analyze that by flow cytometry. So on the y-axis, you're looking at HLA-DR, which is a marker of macrophages, um, and GFP is on the right. And so there are two things to note about this. The first is that we have a very pure population of macrophages. This isn't gated on anything. So at the end of six days, the only thing that's present in the culture are macrophages. Um, and when we modify that, you can see that using just a quarter the amount of virus, we get really robust gene expression in macrophages that isn't seen using the traditional um, CAR T cell approach. Uh, we then labeled these cells with EGFP and firefly luciferase, which is a bioluminescent. Um, uh, when you induce, introduce a substrate, it, it induces bioluminescence of these cells. So in this case, it is not the tumor that you're looking at, but the cells that we modified. Um, and we engrafted these cells into um, an established U87 glioblastoma tumor that was in injected intracranially. And then we evaluated whether or not those cells um, persist. And what you can see is that whether they're expressing just our control truncated CD19, which we use to introduce 
um, a modified cell but doesn't have any signaling capacity, it's just a marker of transduction, or whether they express a therapeutic payload like IL-12, those cells persist for, um, in this experiment, up to 25 days. When we harvest the brains from those animals and do immunohistochemistry um, on them, we find that um, those cells are in fact infiltrating as measured by um, human CD45 stain, which are expressed by our cells, but not by the tumor cells. So the uh, macrophages that we're engineering actually still follow some of the rules that um, an endogenous macrophage might in their capacity to infiltrate tumor tissue. Well, just to make sure that our cells weren't getting trapped in the central nervous system because there was no place to go, um, we did a flank tumor um, to demonstrate similarly that those cells when injected into the flank don't leave. Um, we're doing the more granular um, experiments now where we're looking at draining lymph nodes, spleen, uh, lungs, kidney, liver, all of the organs surrounding there to make sure that when we inject these cells directly into the tumor that is in fact where they stay. Um, there are a number of uh, data points about validating these cells after they've been modified that were, have already been published, so I'm not going to go through all of that data today in the interest of time, um, but we do see that there's a maintenance of macrophage phenotype and gene expression. They maintain viability and they retain their biological functions, things like cytokine production and phagocytosis. Um, there is long-term persistence of engineered gene expression both in vitro and in vivo. Um, in vitro, I believe we've gone out about 70 days, um, and in vivo now just over two months. Uh, we've also performed CRISPR editing um, in the event that we needed to eliminate some of these immunosuppressive proteins. The last thing we would want to do, obviously, by introducing these cells is to um, add to the immunosuppression that already exists in the tumor. Um, we have not done a whole lot of that since then because we haven't yet found it to be an issue. Um, but we do have the capacity to eliminate genes that are expressed by these cells prior to their um, delivery. So we have um, initially we started with a kind of high throughput approach in which we would engineer um, the viral vectors, we would make them into virus and then we would validate their expression. Um, not all of these could advance, um, so we had to choose one or two and then the ones that I'm going to talk about today include the single chain IL-12 and one of the bispecific T-cell engagers. So we chose IL-12 because it was a really well-defined entity. Uh, it has been tested as a therapeutic in over 95 different clinical trials with promising results, but it did have complications. Um, for example, systemic administration of therapeutic doses can be toxic. IL-12 is a potent pro-inflammatory mediator, and so it ended up um, accumulating in the serum with uh, repeat dosing and uh, causing systemic toxicities. And the rapid turnover of IL-12 requires frequent dosing. So not unlike an antibody, um, you would have to come in frequently to get uh, low-dose IL-12. Um, and even then, it, um, it only lasts, I think it lasts a fraction of the time of the antibodies that we see. So it would actually be more frequent almost daily. Um, so our idea was to engineer IL-12. This is a single chain IL-12 into these um, macrophages. The hope there being that we would induce uh, gamma cascade, so interferon gamma is one of the most potent pro-inflammatory cytokines and has a number of downstream influences that are um, generally considered one of the hallmarks for successes in immunotherapy. If the interferon gamma levels are increased in CAR T-cell patients, for example, this is um, in general a very good sign that they're having a, a response to their tumor. And because all of these cells can make interferon gamma, the hope is that we would then induce um, a multicellular cascade, including the um, polarization of T cells to TH1 type helper cells, um, so induce cytotoxicity of both CD8 positive T cells and natural killer cells, expansion of all populations and antibody class switching in B cells. Uh, the experiment that we have yet to do is the hope that we would be able to convert an immunosuppressive macrophage to a pro-inflammatory macrophage. And these are experiments that are ongoing. Um, the idea being that if there are a number of macrophages populating the solid tumor, it would be really, really helpful to have them convert from suppressing immune responses to enhancing them. And what that would mean, hopefully, is that we would need fewer um, engineered macrophages to induce this uh, large, much larger cascade, um, which repurposes those macrophages to help the immune responses. And so just some of the data to show um, what that vector looks like. 
Um, you can see there the constructs, again, that uh, truncated CD19T is in all of our vectors, um, and we express it either on its own, as shown there on the left, um, or um, separated by a T2A, so this is a single mRNA that is generated, a um, single transcript that is then cleaved um, post-transcriptionally, and a uh, single chain IL-12, which is um, a single chain of the heterodimer that is uh, bioactive. And when we do that, we can see the um, amount of lentivirus that we need is slightly higher. We think that's probably because of the size of the payload. Um, so you need 750 lentiviral particles in order to get equivalent expression of the CD19T on its own. Um, and when you look at the amount of IL-12 that that generates, the IL-12 concentration that's produced by these cells increases along with the amount of lentivirus that's being used. And so this was very encouraging because um, it's nice to have a titratable system. And so if we know that we can modulate the amount of therapeutic payload dependent on the amount of lentivirus that's delivered to these cells, that would be hugely beneficial. We also um, just did some basic proof of concept to show that they actually were able to induce interferon gamma secretion as we hypothesized. Um, and so the IL-12 that these cells are making is in fact functional and seems to um, encourage persistence. So on the bottom, you're just looking at the amount of interferon gamma that's being secreted um, by T cells. And you can see a significant increase with um, either recombinant IL-12 or the um, virally encoded IL-12. And in fact, that outperforms the duration of interferon gamma um, secreted as opposed to just a CD3, CD28 stimulation, which is the standard activation for T cells. And importantly, we wanted to look at um, the autocrine effects. We weren't sure whether IL-12 would be able to back signal on the cells that we were delivering, and we wanted to know what that would look like. We had made the observation that under any condition, there wasn't IL-12 receptor expressed by our engineered macrophages. Um, so whether you were treating them with something pro-inflammatory like LPS and interferon gamma in the top right, or anti-inflammatory conditions like IL-10, IL-4, and TGF-beta, or U87 conditioned media, we don't see robust expression of the IL-12 receptor, which suggested that they may not have significant autocrine effects. When we took those cells from three different patients that we had modified um, and looked at them by nanostring, this is just gene expression analysis for a panel of 770 different myeloid specific genes, we don't see significant increases in um, most of the genes, the exception there being the red bar in all three patients, which is IL-12. Um, which was encouraging too that we um, saw the gene that we were trying to transcribe. And the other few genes that you see are pro-inflammatory, either chemokines or MHC class 2. In order to show whether or not there actually was an impact, uh, um, unfortunately we were using mice that were immunodeficient and so there weren't other cells for us to turn on in that system. Um, so here we um, needed to back engineer a little bit in order to be able to make mouse um, bone marrow derived engineered macrophages. And this turned out to be actually much harder than engineering human macrophages. So this took a great deal of doing, taking the bone marrow derived um, progenitors and differentiating them in a variety of conditions and then transducing with the uh, mouse IL-12. And you can see there on the bottom that we don't get as efficient um, transcription um, or gene expression, but we are able to get IL-12, um, bioactive IL-12 secreted at much higher doses of lentiviral um, transduction. And so at this point, we partnered with Chiba and Eric Holland um, at the Fred Hutch um, using the RCAS model that um, Eric has developed and, um, and really advanced for um, a number of different models. And in this setting, we did um, the PDGF-driven um, glioblastoma in the RCAS system, and we injected these mouse um, bone marrow-derived cells that were expressing murine IL-12. And the biggest takeaway from this um, was um, that the control-engineered macrophages didn't seem to recruit CD8-positive T cells, and this is pretty consistent with what is seen in this model over the years. Um, but when we injected IL-12 secreting engineered macrophages, we actually saw robust T cell recruitment and a number of genes that were consistent with the induction of an interferon gamma cascade. Um, in this setting, we did find a lot of toxicity, so um, we sort of had to backtrack and uh, try to work this out in the human system to see if that was a species issue or um, something that we could reproduce in the NSG system. 
So here uh, we went back to the human engineered macrophages and um, injected autologous PBMCs into those mice and looked for extension of survival. And you can see that when the IL-12 gems are in, um, injected, we do see extension of survival. Um, and this is injected into an established tumor um, in the flank. And when we inject the control engineered macrophages expressing just IL-12, uh, just CD19, T, we um, don't see any extension of survival. This is consistent with a delay in tumor burden growth. It's a dose-dependent um, response. So the more IL-12 secreting gems you have, the slower your tumor grows. Um, so this suggested to us that the IL-12 was doing what it was supposed to do and that the macrophages that we were injecting weren't actually adding to the problem. So in the NSG setting, we found that these cells were non-toxic. There's still an awful lot of toxicity work to be done before we advance this to patients, but we did find targeted protein delivery in that we don't see um, elevated IL-12 in the serum or anywhere else. Um, there is efficacy that we've demonstrated in these NSG models. And because these cells don't divide, which we showed in that first paper, this may allow a dose um, escalation or titration by either changing the amount of lentivirus that's being used or the cell number that's being administered. Uh, for these next experiments, we really were eager to get um, a sense of what was happening in a complete intact tumor microenvironment. So we partnered with Vainu Polarisetti, who is a surgical oncologist at the University of Washington, working on advanced GI cancers. And he has a system in his lab that allows um, slice culture uh, over the course of seven to 14 days of um, freshly resected biopsies from patients with these advanced malignancies. And so we injected some of our um, engineered macrophages into those slice cultures and found a significant increase that um, performs as well as recombinant IL-12 in that setting. So we were hopeful that these cells could potentially engraft in a human and overcome immunosuppressive um, microenvironments in a number of different types of tumors. An important thing to note about this um, experiment was that we didn't add exogenous PBMCs. So presumably this increased cell death is either the product of the cells that we're injecting or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that were not uh, functioning in those tissue sections. Also encouraging from that study was um, the induction of pro-inflammatory cytokines that you might hope to see, like GMCSF and interferon gamma, um, in the presence of um, and kind of enhanced over what we typically see with recombinant protein um, expressed in the presence of IL-12 secreting gems, but not in our control. And so we are now working toward a proof of concept phase one study for patients with solid tumors. Again, this is in partnership with Blue Rock Therapeutics. Um, in which an apheresis product will undergo a similar monocyte selection. We're now working on scaling up this product, um, and we have um, the following timeline where we're hoping um, the clinical lentivirus vector has, um, is ready to be released. It was manufactured at the Fred Hudge, and so we have a number of um, due diligence experiments to do on that um, GMP product, and then there will be uh, meetings with the FDA over the next year or two and hopefully we'll be able to get into a phase one trial sometime in 2021. Um, the other candidate that I'm hoping to talk about is the um, bispecific T cell engager. This one is specifically um, for a glioblastoma tumor antigen. Um, these bispecific T cell engagers are in a number of um, clinical trials, and what they do is they actually um, interact with a tumor-specific antigen, in this case, um, EGFR-V3. And on the T cell side, they interact with the CD3 epsilon. And um, the biophysics is such that the CD3 signaling is all that is uh, needed um, to activate T cells. You don't actually need a co-stimulatory signal in this setting. Unfortunately, in a purified uh, setting, bites have poor efficacy in the clinic. This is possibly due to um, turnover or poor tissue penetrance. But EGFRB3 is an appealing target because it's expressed in approximately 30% of patients with GBM tumors. Um, this is a mutated EGFR um, and has really been a pivotal point for a number of clinical trials. Um, Amgen has the um, bispecific T cell engager and there are a number of um, phase one and two studies that are happening um, at Duke and across the country now. Um, 
to look at the efficacy of um, systemically delivered bispecific T-cell engagers. Um, the way that the construct looks is to have the, the variable domains of the EGFRV3 binder on the one end and the anti-CD3 epsilon binder on the other. Uh, the only changes that we made to this construct are none in the binding domains, but we added a 6S HIST tag. Um, so this histidine allows detection um, and quantification of our secreted protein. And we modified the linker length because um, there has been work done since this came out, not by us, um, demonstrating that uh, modified linker length can actually increase potency um, and backend signaling. So when we engineered that into our um, our macrophages as we did with the IL-12 construct, we first looked for um, binding to EGFRV3 expressing target cells. We used two cell lines here, K562s and 293Ts that had been engineered to overexpress this uh, variant of EGFR. And then we stained for anti-HIS with a PE and used flow cytometry to analyze um, expression uh, or binding rather. And uh, what we found is really robust binding to the EGFRV3 suggesting that in the supernatant, there was bispecific T-cell engager that was functional, at least on the tumor cell side of binding. Uh, we then um, developed an assay in-house, which is essentially an ELISA for detection of this bispecific T-cell engager. Um, and with the accumulation in that supernatant, you can see that we are getting nanogram um, per mil quantities of um, that bispecific T-cell engager. It's not true if we just pull supernatant off, we have far less, um, which is closer to background. So it does seem like we're making lower concentrations than we did with IL-12, which is to be expected, I think, um, with EGFR um, bite not being a native protein. Um, so there might be some issues with folding. However, when we add um, these gems to T cells, we then looked for activation, uh, things that you might expect downstream of CD3 signaling. Um, such as increases of the IL-2 receptor, which is CD25, or the early activation marker, CD69, and we see really robust activation of our T cells when cultured with um, the tumor cell targets, as well as the engineered macrophages secreting the bispecific T cell engager. And similarly, we see really good induction um, in a bispecific engager um, manner that is, um, induces granzyme B production, as well as TNF-alpha, not shown here is interferon gamma as well, um, for both CD4 and CD8 positive T cells, suggesting that the T cells are getting activated um, and that the bispecific T cell engager that the cells are putting out is actually bioactive. When we put these cells into a killing assay, um, here we're using the bispecific secreting gems and um, the U87 glioblastoma uh, tumor cell line. In just a four hour assay, we're seeing really robust killing in a dose dependent fashion, suggesting that that bite is functional. We were really excited to put this into mice, but unfortunately we did, did not see um, a very overwhelming response to um, just the bite gems that we injected compared to um, the control gems. And so that led us to question uh, whether the bite was actually sufficient to do uh, what we wanted it to do. It seems like there was a benefit early on but um, the tumor outgrowth um, seemed to outpace the ability of the bispecific T cell engagers to turn on the T cells that were injected IV. So we had done some work to determine if we could do two genes in a single cell. And so this experiment, we were just using a CD19T expressing lentivirus and an EGFP expressing one. Um, and what we found was that when we put those two um, viruses into the same cell, we saw about 90% of the cells expressing both CD19T and EGFP, which was encouraging that we could potentially get a single cell expressing both of the things that we want. Um, so we used the two that I've just described, the bispecific T cell engager and IL-12, and when we put those into mice, it actually looks much better, um, suggesting that these cells may be um, best used in combination. So we're now considering as an anti-CD28, which is a co-stimulatory molecule for T cells, um, as well as IL-12 with established tumors. Um, so what I've shown so far is that human and mouse macrophages can be engineered to express surface or secreted proteins, including cytokines, uh, full-length antibodies, which I didn't have time to show today, 
but we now have um, engineered a number of checkpoints, um, the PDL1 and CTLA4, um, in particular, the ones that we're looking at in vivo now, um, and tumor specific uh, T cell engagers. We've also shown that engineered macrophages can traffic to and infiltrate solid tumors um, where they tend to persist and express lentivirally encoded genes. Um, these genes are detectable for over a month um, and now probably more like two. Um, there is some drop off and so we're trying to figure out whether that is cell death or uh, loss of gene expression. So these engineered macrophages may allow local and stable delivery of therapeutic proteins to reduce toxicities and, and frequency of invention, intervention. Um, so some of the other advantages include that this has the potential to be antigen independent. So in tumors like glioblastoma, where there isn't a large mutagenic burden, um, we may expect that this would be helpful in recruiting and activating NK cells. There's the potential for direct application to the tumor um, with single local and titratable dosing, either by modifying the amount of virus or the number of cells that we deliver. And hopefully, um, with the correct pro-inflammatory mediators, we could alter the tumor microenvironment at a point that's pivotal to the immune response and allows activation of a number of different types of cells. Um, the direct application to the tumor is something that um, we were extremely interested in, um, in kind of fixing, because we were hoping to treat patients who had uh, metastatic or multifocal or non-resectable diseases. And so we looked at what happened to these cells when we injected them intravenously. Um, when we inject these cells IV into an animal that expresses a tumor in the flank, what you see is that immediately those cells, and that's 10 minutes after injection traffic to the lung, which could be hugely problematic if you're um, injecting something that's pro-inflammatory. And then over the course of about four days, um, they will find their way to the tumor where they um, will reside for the long term. The difficulty here is twofold. The first is, of course, the toxicity that could happen in that first four days before they find their way to the tumor, but also so there's a lot of loss of cells, and um, we are now working to determine where those go. Uh, we have noted bioluminescent urine, and so we think that they are going from the lungs to the liver, through the kidneys, and then being excreted with a small subset of them trafficking to the tumor. This is also true, although it takes slightly longer, um, with an intracranial tumor. Um, and when we do a dose titration, we see that it's just about 1.5% of these cells um, when we compare to those that are directed, um, directly injected into the tumor. We see about 1.5% of IV injected cells um, as measured by bioluminescence, which is not a great recovery and um, means that 88.5 or 98.5% of them are being lost. Um, so we're looking for ways that we can both improve trafficking um, to overcome some of that cell loss as well as to minimize toxicity. And so to that end, we were um, again partnering with some of our colleagues here in the department to have access to patient samples um, from which we isolated um, the macrophages that were already present in the tumor. These are not engineered, just the ones that typically populate that microenvironment. And we performed single cell RNA sequencing on them um, to identify what genes were um, robustly induced in the tumor microenvironment. And we found um, 22 different genes that correlated with outcome in not just patients with glioma, but um, in a number of solid tumors, ovarian, lung, prostate, um, and, and many others, but not interestingly in, in benign meningiomas or thyroid. Um, so it wasn't across the board in every tumor, but it was in many of them, and it seemed to correlate with um, prognosis. So with those genes, um, we identified a number of genes that came on, and we were encouraged to find some of the um, single agent targets that people have described, like TREM2, CSF1R, and CCL2, as well as a number of other promoters um, that um, we could potentially swap out in our engineered macrophages to um, conditionally express the lentivirally encoded genes. So here what you're looking at is just bulk seek from a number of patients to increase the um, number of patient samples that we had evaluated. And you can see that in circulating monocytes, there's very little expression of these. Um, and in tumor infiltrating macrophages, you see really um, significant increase in a large percentage of those patients. Um, so we took these promoters and as a proof of concept, just using the HIF-1-alpha um, responsive elements 
to look at whether or not we could conditionally express the genes that we intended. And so here, this is again with uh, Venu's group looking at slice cultures in a hypoxic chamber. Um, so we have the constitutive promoter of EF1 alpha, and you can see really good green expression there. Uh, the mini TK, which is the negative control, it's slightly leaky and allows some gene expression, but it um, is better than um, having absolutely none. We wanted to have some kind of promoter element present there. Um, and then that hypoxia responsive element, which is induced in hypoxic conditions. We then took that into animal studies. So these mice have um, a flank tumor. And when we inject the conditionally expressed, um, conditionally expressing engineered macrophages, which have firefly luciferase under control of the um, HRE, um, that, so they should only turn on when hypoxia is present. When we inject these into the animals, we see really good um, restriction of expression that's present just in the tumor microenvironment and not, again, in the lungs, which would have been um, a big problem. So then we moved into uh, actually having a therapeutic payload um, under control of the HRE. So here you can see um, the green fluorescent protein expression. This construct actually is a, um, an IL-12 GFP fusion protein. So both GFP and IL-12 are driven off of the same promoter. And when put into hypoxia, you can see that we get not quite as good um, expression. Now we're only seeing it in about 43% um, of those cells. It does correlate with um, bioactive IL-12 being secreted. So the hope here is that we would be able to use this in a conditional fashion, either this hypoxia responsive element or one of the other promoters that we've identified to conditionally regulate gene expression in cells that were systemically delivered. So the major takeaways from um, what I've shared today, um, I hope that I've convinced you that these engineered macrophages can deliver protein biologics to solid tumors in both a titratable and targetable fashion, and that it's possible to have tumor-specific induction of lentiviral gene expression, which may support um, and enhance safety and targeting for those cells that may be systemically delivered. Um, this is a much longer range project. We're at the very early stages of that. And so we're really excited to see whether or not we can um, do this in a way that is meaningful and could be translated to patients to improve safety. We're also partnering with a number of different groups um, to examine varied and indication specific payloads outside of oncology. Um, with Blue Rock, we are currently ex um, exploring, um, in addition to oncology, autoimmunity and graft versus host disease multiple drug resistant um, bacterial pulmonary infections. This is an exciting collaboration that we have with Sean Skerritt and Owen West at um, Harborview. Um, regenerative medicine, in particular post-myocardial infarct and enzyme replacement for rare genetic disorders to restore mitochondrial dysfunction. So with that, I would like to say thank you to the very long list of people who have done most of this work, um, including Kara and Nicole in my lab who really started um, and, and made the discoveries of how to engineer macrophages, as well as um, Jen and Katie, who have taken both the BITE and the IL-12 projects forward. Harrison's been leading the IL-12 and with support from everybody else in the lab. All of the histology and pathology that's been done both at Children's and um, Fred Hutch and, and the University of Washington, as well as all of our colleagues in the department. Um, I, I couldn't even list all of the people that helped us um, gain access to the patient samples. Um, this is such a strong coordinated effort and it's been really amazing to see that pipeline come together and be able to make use of some of those samples that um, we've had access to, as well as surgical oncology um, at the university and bioinformatics team who helped with some of that early um, single cell RNA-seq data that I didn't have a chance to show but represented about three years of work. And then all of my colleagues in the human biology division at the Fred Hutch, they've been so welcoming and um, it's been a lovely group to be a part of. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. It was great. Thank you very much. Questions, anybody? Just speak up. Yeah, hi, uh, Courtney, this is Anoop. Um, I just had a couple of questions for you. Um, really nice work. Um, could you to just talk a little bit about distinguishing, um, at least in the CNS context, uh, ma macrophages versus microglia and sort of what your thoughts are on that interaction and yeah, so um, that's a really good question, and we get that one a lot. Is um, what what or, you know microglia driven versus those that are um, uh, macrophage driven? 
Yeah, um, and I, I think that there, you know, Eric and, and more insight into the differences that are apparent between the microglial contributions and the macrophages, we definitely see that there are two populations, one that seems to have been there and one that seems to be arriving. Um, functionally, we have not done a lot of, um, of looking into what they're doing in terms of suppressing immune responses, nor have we looked at whether or not they're able to be converted. But I think that's a really important point um, that moving forward, especially as we do these, um, these conversion assays where we're looking to repurpose those anti-inflammatory macrophages to pro-inflammatory ones to see what is a microglia at the outset and what was a macrophage and see what their, their relative contributions to that are. That's a great point. Anybody else, anybody? That was a good question. Hey, Courtney, this is Shiva. That was, that was fantastic. I just had one question about the BITE project. Um, do you get a sense that you need T cells in the microenvironment for those BITE molecules to actually engage, by specifically engage? Um, just because in GBMs, there are very few T cells in the microenvironment, or are you expecting those bites to actually recruit T cells from the periphery? Yeah. yeah, so that's a great question, and absolutely. So we have only done those experiments when we have co-injected T cells, um, IV. And in the NSG model, obviously the blood-brain barrier is very different. And so in, in the human setting, we don't see many T cells there. Um, so one of the things that we're hoping to do with either IL-12 or CCL-5 or something is to help those T cells get there so that when they arrive, there's something to engage them. Um, I don't know if we'll be successful in getting them to either traffic to or accumulate there, um, but that's an excellent point. Yes, I absolutely think that they, they need to be present and they need to not be exhausted probably.